What does the word progressive mean to you? Does it put a smile on your face and make you think of a brighter future? Or have you heard it being used to describe people or ideas, but aren't quite sure exactly what it means? Or maybe you're like me, someone who works in the progressive space, but uses the word cautiously. Because let's be honest, it could be a bit of a loaded term. You're in luck, my friends. This is our first podcast episode, and yes, we're starting our adventure by diving into our favorite loaded word, progressive. But before I pass the mic over to our guest today, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our presence on the traditional and unceded territory of hundreds of First Nations, who are the traditional caretakers of the land that we call California. Today, we're going to talk about the word and concept progressive. I'm excited to be here with Los Angeles Supervisor Holly Mitchell and Pablo Rodriguez, founding executive director of Communities for a New California. I want to thank you both for being here today. You have both dedicated your lives to empowering your communities in Los Angeles, Central Valley, and statewide. You've also navigated a lot of different spaces and spoken to many different audiences on the ground, in different levels of government, and certainly in the public eye. We really want to unpack this word and concept progressive. I would say it's used in a lot of different spaces. It means different things to different people. But the reason why I wanted to have the two of you on to speak to this is, A, you both live and work and are dedicated to communities in very different areas of California. But in the conversations I've had with each of you, it's been very clear we all share a set of values and a shared vision for the state. And so oftentimes it also feels like You know, I think about, you know, with Courage's work, I will say that we have a progressive majority in the state, but then a lot of people always want to figure out ways in which we don't see eye to eye or or the messaging works in one area or another. So really want to unpack this with you. First, I'd love to hear from each of you. What does the word progressive mean to you? And Holly, do you want to go first? And then I'll have Pablo go. Sure. You know, I, I knew you were going to ask the question. So I said, well, you know, let me act like look it up to get the, the real deal. And so, you know, I Googled it the new lazy girl's way instead of going <laughs> to the actual doggy or dictionary at you know. home. But the second definition is favoring or implementing social reform or new liberal ideas. And so even though, as you stated, you know, Pablo and I work in different geographic regions of the state, I would suffice it to say, and Pablo can feel absolutely free to disagree with me if he so chooses, that we are serving families who have very similar needs. There are families who are uh, multiple generation, perhaps, living and trying to work and educate their children. And what Secretary Yolanda Richardson said to me, and I've incorporated the term into my own kind of vernacular, which is hardly served communities. We like to say hard to serve as if, you know, communities are willfully hard to serve. No, they're hardly served, hardly served by government, hardly served um, in some instances by, you know, the other sectors, hardly served in that they've been historically underinvested in, under-resourced. And so from my perspective, being a progressive is acknowledging that, owning that, and really attempting to turn that history on its head and really look at all things from an equity lens. That's what progressive politics means to me, that we're going to be progressive in forward thinking in terms of how we meet the needs of every California regardless of one's zip code, regardless of one's status, regardless of one's mother's educational attainment, that's often an indicator used to determine the trajectory of a child. You know, regardless of those things, progressive politics and policies would suggest that we're going to invest and develop a system that is better, that meets the needs of everyone equitably. Paula, as Holly mentioned, she wanted to hear from you. I'd love to hear from you too. What does the word progressive mean to you? 
Thank you for the question. And like Supervisor Mitchell, I, I spend a lot of time really thinking about this, right? I build upon Supervisor Mitchell's definition because I agree with everything that is being said. I think that what I will add is the reality, right? That progressives do not believe that in change has to be incremental. And I think that the reality, right, is that we need to recognize that two things. Well, forgive me, a number of things. Let me see if how it can go through this. We are working and bettering, right, on a, on a regular basis, our government, our system of government, and I'll take the federal government that was formed to serve white men who owned property. That includes people. And then the second thing that they were, the government was built to do is that they were concurrently, an economy was built to serve the transfer of that wealth from one white man to another, the meaning their sons usually, right? And so what I've learned and what I really thought about the word progressive is that it, it really definitely is an umbrella term that I subscribe to. But as I was really thinking about this over the last couple of weeks, since you all invited me, is that I came to, to realize that under that umbrella of progressiveness, I am actually an abolitionist. And what we're working to abolish is a oppression economy that benefits from institutionalized racism. And we are working to build a liberation economy. And so one that allows everybody to live and profit and prosper freely. But then again, that definition of progressive, right, I think is really important because the changes that we're talking about needing to make, we can't do them incrementally. They can happen in our generation. And I'm really grateful for Jeremy Greer and Solana Rice from Liberation and the Generation for introducing me to this concept. Um, and I think that that's the way that I would identify and the way that I will be identifying myself the rest of my life. I'm an abolitionist working to abolish the oppression economy and to build a liberation economy. Thank you, Pablo. While you were talking, it prompted me to think about two different things. Supervisor Mitchell said she was a Virgo, so she likes list making. So I assume the way in which you've talked about these different lists has sort of um, been upper alley. But what I found interesting about both what you and Holly were speaking to is also as you were talking, you were talking about other ways in which you've taken language and also rethought other language switches too. So this idea too of that progressive and making progress is also about changing, but it's very much about changing systems or thinking about how powerful systems sort of impose a particular kind of language or a particular way of being. And so part of being progressive and part of being an abolitionist is just as much fighting against the system, but also the language of the system, which brings me to, and as I phrase it at the top, so progressive can be used in a lot of different ways. In some ways, I feel like it can sometimes be weaponized. It can be sometimes a way to just shorthand give people a sense of the types of values or the type of leader somebody will be. Pablo, what do you see as the challenges and benefits of using the actual word progressive? Well, I mean, I think that the biggest challenge is that we get lost, especially if we run into people who disagree with us, that they end up wanting to debate the word itself. And my attitude towards that is that what we do with ourselves is much more important than what we call ourselves. So don't get lost on the word progressive, because I also just use the word abolitionist, and I also identify as Chicano, for example. But I think that what is really important is to really focus on the on the signal. So if we do end up in a conversation where we do want to have that discussion about the definitions, I think that what I have really been thinking about that I introduced earlier, right, is that the reality is that we are this generation's manifestation of ab abolitionists who ended slavery. And we're working towards building an economy that served all people, that were working to build a government, just like Supervisor Mitchell talked about, that served all people, not just the wealthy who had access to, you know, lawyers and in modern times, consultants that can be up at, or lobbyists that can be up at in Sacramento's capital or in Washington, D.C. The important thing that we can do as progressive is to have the courage to shine a bright light on the oppression, right, that happens or the injustices that happen within the oppression economy. And no, not, not only that, I think that the important thing that we need to do is identify ourselves as progressive is to denounce those injustices, right? As we call for the construction of a liberation economy. It's not enough just to shine a light, as many people sometimes do, just like, let me just, we're going to, we're going to provide education on a given issue, but it's not enough. And I think that the career supervisor Mitchell really shows 
not only can you run as a progressive and win as a progressive, but the real important steps is that she denounces the injustices that she sees. And <clears throat> the reality is that that is what draws more people to this whole movement. Because I, I expect that if you were to ask Supervisor Mitchell, while we may not win every fight, what is really important is to be seen fighting. And I think that that's a really important thing for how we go forward as progressives in California. Well, so Holly, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that question as well. So what do you see as the challenges and benefits of the word progressive? But also I'd love to hear sort of your reaction to what Pablo was saying as well. I couldn't agree with Pablo more. I think you know, the only thing I will add to his brilliant definition and descri description is, and I agree that we shouldn't get caught up in the terminology and the language and waste any energy debating that. Let's debate the ramifications of failed policies that have left far too many people behind. That's the meat. But I also think it's important to use those terms. And you know, I identify as a feminist, a womanist, a progressive. I have stood on the Senate floor and, and wouldn't kind of acquiesce, give away the term pro-life. I am pro-choice. Uh, and think a more accurate description of that historic debate is pro-choice, anti-choice. Because there was no one on the Senate floor when I served more pro-life than me. Because I would vote in support of child care funding and nutrition funding and after-school programs. And a CalWORKs grant that actually meant parents could indeed pull their children up out of poverty. And many of my colleagues who self-identify as pro-life would not vote in support of those policies or those budget <laughs> allocations. So how are you pro-life when really you abandon the fetus upon delivery? And so I often, now I know that that's a losing fight, that that ship has sailed with regard to how we perceive the term pro-life. But I was always important to me to acknowledge that when I could remind people that if you are indeed pro-life, that that should reflect a support of a series of policy decisions and budget allocations to impact the full life of that child. I think it's important that we use the terms, that we help people understand through our actions what they really mean, not get caught up in semantics, but indeed lean in and defend what we mean by the terminology to help people understand that when we're talking about it, that we're at least talking from a place of common agreement about it, what it means to be a progressive. You know, I've been known to say with regard to when the legislature attained a democratic supermajority and people inferred from that, oh, we're going to be able to roll out all of these frankly, progressive policies. And I was like, you know, all Democrats aren't created equal. And, you know, in, in some instances, being a mod Democrat was, was hip. It was like orange is the new black. Being a mod was kind of the new hip thing to be. So I think it's really important that we hold people accountable to what they say they are and really have a common kind of definition or, or sense of practices or principles that help define these terms. That's a really good point. And for me, this also just reminds me of how, you know, just like any language, the term progressive can be used to help unify people around a set of shared values. It can also be used very much or weaponized very much to drive people apart or as I've seen in some political circles, to exclude people out of that. You know, they're sort of like, you're not progressive enough or things like that. But one of the things I also want to unpack in this conversation, again, one of the reasons I wanted to bring you in particular, both of you, there is this sort of, to me, a misconception that people in different parts of the state have different values and want different things. And that's, again, like an argument that sometimes politicians make as to why they vote against some of the what I would consider progressive bills. But also for me, there's a little bit of this, this sense of giving people more and more fuel to not do things, to not make bigger changes, because oh, we can't get that sort of policy passed or we can't get this person elected in this region because they're too progressive for the region. You know, I've heard that argument in so many different places and that's obviously outside of California, but especially within California, I would say in different parts of the region. 
Hubble, I'd love to hear from you in specific, because I think for you, you, you obviously identify very strongly as a progressive. Central Valley is probably one of the places in California that's most cited as a place. This is where progressive things can't get done because the region's not there. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Do you feel like the word progressive has a different meaning in the Central Valley than in a place like Los Angeles where Holly is? Or sort of how does that dynamic sit with you? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's a really easy and hard question to answer, right? I had the opportunity to live throughout California during my career and experience this, right? And definitely there's some parts and some people who will say staying progressive in the San Joaquin Valley or the Inland Empire is a four-letter word. But I think that all of those, those debates about what we identify ourselves in is Yes, it's something that we should discuss, but I think that if we really dig into it, it's a group of consultants that were advising, you know, candidates of like how to distinguish themselves to win elections for an electorate that no longer exists in California. There are three new majority Latino congressional districts in the San Joaquin Valley, and of those, the majority and highest propensity voters are Latina women. I bring that up to say the people that continue to identify as moderate Democrats who cite polls that say a generic Democrat runs in this race versus a Republican does this or that. And because this is a swing district, this is the way that I'm going to build my platform. I think it is really lazy. And I think that it is really dangerous not to dig deeper than that, right? Because the reality is that the mother's of the the voters that I'm just talking about, right? The decision makers in households. My mom did not come to California to have a generic life, to have generic dreams. So why would she ever vote for a generic Democrat? That's that makes no sense. And that's what it means to me when I hear somebody say that they're a moderate Democrat because they cite that this is a swing district, this and the other. But the reality is that Progressives have an opportunity to really redefine these regions and say, we are a battleground. And when we battle on ideas, battle on ideas that we grew up in as products of the Central Valley, right, where you may not necessarily been able to drink the water from the, the town that you're in, you may get sick by breathing the air, your parents were taken advantage of and exploited in the workplace. We are inherently and naturally progressives. Our politics and our values are to change those realities, right? And so I think that, yes, there's work to be done and there's bad, (laughs) there's bad fame that comes with the word progressive, but we also have the opportunity to really cite the victories that have come and that have come at a significant pace when we have not accepted incremental change and when we have not accepted a platform of being moderate. I think that we win. And we went significantly improve our lives when we go with a progressive definition and a progressive future for California. And Pablo, what you're saying also reminds me, I think, of something that you and I have also talked about, which is when people are thinking about, again, these sort of battleground states or battleground regions, there's sort of like people almost paper over it thinking like we characterize every single voter, every person in that region or that state as like a purple voter, you know, somebody who's very much in the middle when actually it's a battleground state because like you just said, there's people on the more conservative side, there's people on the more progressive side. And so it feels like to me, you know, what you're saying about with redistricting, that has just really helped to illustrate how, again, the lines shifted, but all of a sudden now you have districts that are more democratic, more progressive. And so now it just sort of, to me, highlights how there is that progressive majority in the Central Valley. People just weren't paying attention to it before just because people are thinking so much this is like a Republican region or a Republican district. But these progressive folks have always been there. Holly, I'd love to hear from you because, you know, you're in Los Angeles. I'm in Oakland. Again, like places where people assume are very progressive. Do you feel like the word progressive, the meaning of it has different meaning in different parts of the state? And what do you think about it specifically when it comes to the Los Angeles communities? So, you know, the reality is you mentioned polling and people will refer to polling um, that identify, you know, purple districts or purple community. And, and, And I think let's be clear about who gets to participate in a poll. It is a, by virtue of, 
technology or by virtue of who has a phone or who isn't working and has the luxury to engage in a poll, it's quite frankly, generally a a rather elite group of people. And so if we're going to base those decisions on poll results, I think we need to acknowledge that. You know, unless we get very creative and expand our concept of traditional polling, where we actually are, are putting boots on the ground and are asking promoters or promotores or, or others who actually have boots on the ground and have contact with people where they are to really inform kind of our sentiment about public opinion. You know, even when you think about polls that our, our daily newspapers run, well, the daily newspapers, quite frankly, have right to a certain grade level in terms of reading comprehension. So I just think there's so many reasons to question kind of poll results, quite frankly, particularly issues like this, not around, you know, a particular attitude about a candidate or, a, or an initiative, but just to get general feelings about governance and to really ascertain whether people want progressive policies or status quo. So I think we have to acknowledge that. You know, secondly, with regard to the elected officials, the the frame of your initial question, I always hearken back to why I chose to run for office in the first place. For me, it wasn't a a aha moment. I woke up one morning and just decided it's something that I should do. It really was based on years of community-based work where I felt I could bring the perspective of the community from whence I come to a legislative body that I could translate, if you will, policy needs from my community into legislation and vice versa. And then come back to my community and explain to folks what is happening and why and why they should care and be engaged. And so for me, keeping my belly low to the ground on a regular basis, not just during campaign season, was always important in terms of me being firsthand, deeply in touch with how my community feels. Now, be clear, I represent large geographic areas. Now, as a member of the LA County Board of Supervisors, up to 2 million people, very diverse communities. And so then I have a responsibility to hear, understand, and filter individual requests and needs through what I think is the best policymaking for the county as a whole. Uh, And I think that that is, can and should be applied in every district, in every region. California isn't as progressive as one likes to think. We know that there are pockets um, in the state of California, you know, the state of Jefferson people just all over who aren't, don't meet the traditional definition of the concept of progressive. And that applies to LA County as well. I certainly have heard from those people in reaction to policies I've brought forward um, where I'm demanding a lens of equity be used as we apply and use the ARPA dollars that came from the federal government, I, I, we have certainly heard it in response to our COVID-19 public health safety measures. So I think that California as a whole isn't as progressive as sometimes we like to spin it. And that certainly can apply to LA County as well. I have one last question for you, which I say with a lot of regret. I could have this conversation with both of you for a really long time, which is again why we invited you to this. Just really glad to have this time. The last question I have is kind of, I think, something that we've all sort of alluded to. I also want to tease out a couple of main themes where it feels like we've talked about the word, again, progressive as much about lived experience, both in terms of past, but also thinking about the ways in which we are acting and doing things on behalf of our communities. Not everyone would necessarily identify as progressive or likely do, and I believe actually do, share a lot of the same values and are willing and want to fight for the same things. So as an example, I can think like, Paula, like you were saying, people fighting for clean air and clean water, but also thinking about fighting for a community-defined sense of public safety. So everyone feels safe, no matter who they are, where they live, and what their interactions are with, you know, the different systems. But again, like not everyone identifies as progressive. And I'm not always feeling sometimes like people necessarily identify with each other in that way. Closing question is, what do you think it would really take for more people to identify maybe A, first as a progressive, and then B, sort of as part of a progressive majority here in California? With Holly, love to hear that from you. And then Pablo will go to you after that. 
I think we have to make progressive policymaking real to people. Pablo talked about Prop 187, and I think all of us can identify an event, a policy, something that compelled us into action. And so I think we have to make it real. I think there was an opportunity under the former federal administration that people saw what um, not turning up to the polls can do. I think people saw the inaction, the early inaction around COVID-19 and, and, and what earlier intervention could have led to a different experience for all of us. So I think we just have to remind people and help define the role of government, help define what public policy is and how it impacts their lives directly. I often get the question, what can we do to get people engaged, particularly people of color? And, I, and, and my answer is, it's communities of color who don't have the option not to, because government stands in the gap in far too many examples to meet the needs of our communities uniquely. It is government. It is some elected body at some point in time that made a decision around infrastructure that allows for clean or unsafe water that we all access. It was a body, elected body, that made decisions every day around my ability as a Black woman to vote, to serve in elected office, to home or own in the neighborhood in LA County where I do. There were elected bodies. There are elected bodies that have made decisions to, uh, you know, levy taxes, quite frankly, on, on gasoline. And so while we're seeing this sharp increase, some would argue as a result of the war that's being declared, it's also elected bodies that have impact on costs that each of us bear the brunt of when we put gasoline in our cars to try to go to work or get our kids to child care. So I think we have to make what policy is and what progressive politics looks like real to people and how it applies to every aspect of their lives on a daily basis. And, and I have hope, as you asked us earlier, that when we do that well, that people will get it mm -hmm. and will find ways in their own communities to engage and be involved. Thank you, Helen. I mean, there's sometimes can be an overwhelmingness because I remember tracking in the legislature. I mean, you guys were considering like hundreds and hundreds of bills every single year. And I imagine as county supervisor, there's so much in front of you. So thinking about, you know, all the ways in which community members can get involved and the, all the different decisions that are affecting them that they may or may not know about. It's a pretty significant number, like you said, especially when we're thinking about the ways in which all these different parts of government really touch people's lives. It can be. And yet we have too much at stake to allow that overwhelm to immobilize us. When I ran Crystal Stairs, and actually the year I decided to run for public office was the year the legislature was considering and ultimately did cutting $1 billion out of subsidized child care. And I was organizing through parent voices, an advocacy group that still exists today, child care providers and their parents. Because my point was, you don't have the luxury to not get involved in this fight. Because if this passes, you are the one who will not be able to go to work or school because you will lose your child care subsidy. You, Black or Latina, small business owner running a child care program out of your home, your livelihood will be directly impacted. And so while we all, all can use the excuse that I'm overwhelmed by my everyday life, because Lord knows I am, there is a greater risk confronting us if you don't organize, find your personal agency, and make demands of those who you elect to represent you. So yeah, it can be overwhelming, but as Cher said in the movie, get over it. <laughs> and I don't mean <laughs> trying to say like, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. I'm not saying that at all. But there's so many ways that we can find community, get support, learn about these policies that have, have significant impact on our lives. A billion dollars removed from the subsidized child care industry had immense impact on the state, on a major sector in this state, and on children 
who did not have access to a child care seat. And children don't get do-overs. That two-year-old that didn't get into a high quality, enriching child care environment didn't stay to for the three or four or five years it took us to get that funding back and get another seat available in their community. They don't, they didn't stay stagnant waiting for the adults to figure it out. So there's too much at risk. I'm not asking, you know, community to understand and learn all 4,000 bills introduced each year, but understand the few that have the greatest impact on you, Mm -hmm. your children, you know, the, the quality of air and water in your community, infrastructure, you know, I'm on the Metro board really trying to fight to make sure that we don't cut bus routes in communities where people need public transportation to get to school and work. Um, there are ways in which folks can get involved. People would identify one issue, one thing, and lean in on that and commit to educate themselves and, and find other like-minded thinking people around that. That's a really helpful, important start. Thank you, Holly. As you were talking, there were a lot of things that really inspired me to think a little bit more. Pablo, for me, what Holly was saying also reminded me a little bit what you were saying, terminology that you were using, the liberation economy, bringing some of these issues back to systems and bigger movements. I'm curious to hear what do you think it would take for more people to identify as part of a progressive majority, but also given that you were talking about things like the liberation economy, you're also talking about that sort of interconnectedness. And I think we would all agree, not only is it the people most deeply impacted who can't afford to not do anything about it, it's people who don't think that they're impacted. Even if you aren't, you know, you don't have children, you're not getting childcare, it's really important for you and your well-being for other people who are part of our economy, part of our systems to have that child care, to be able to fully participate at work in their personal lives. Pablo, just want to close this out. What do you think it would take to get more people to feel more connected to each other, take care of each other, and be willing to fight for each other on these shared values and shared goals that we really all have? Yeah, I mean, I again echo everything that Supervisor Mitchell just shared. I, I share everything and I agree with everything that it is that she said. Communities for New California, our organization, was founded with a tagline, our voice, our choice, our California. We really, at that time, were thinking about moving from what we've been able to demonstrate, which is electoral power. And I think the beginning of to answer your question is that there will be more progressives when we're able to demonstrate victories through governing power. The challenge that we have, right, again, and why it's important to say that we need to abolish the oppression economy that profits by preying on people of color and poor people and build a liberation economy is because. Those two systems that I'm just talking about, those institutions, they don't know me. They don't know my family. If they saw me, they would not recognize me. And still to this day, too many of us are seen as property, right? And I'm not necessarily saying that everything is in the same way that it was during slavery. But what I'm talking about is that we are these products to these institutions. The reason that Facebook is free is because we are the product, right? We are the property that makes them money. and so. That's just one manifestation of things that need to be changed in the way that we live our lives. And I think that once we have and are able to really take victory laps for our governing victories in the same way that Supervisor Mitchell was talking about, and there's been many in California in the the 30 years of my life, right, is that we win when we can demonstrate our humanity through our voice, through our actions. We are, in fact, complicated human beings, and so we're not always going to agree on just one term, and that's okay. But I think that once we can really take those victory laps and we can demonstrate what it is that we can achieve through our voice and our actions, I think that that's when we're going to, that's when we will see more people identifying as progressive. And if not, the way that CNC, we frame our work is to say that we form neighborhood committees to work together to finish unfinished neighborhoods. And I think that what I want to highlight about that is that in too many cities and towns in California and across the country, we all know that there's one part of town that has all the resources that a family needs to thrive, while the other does not. I think that maybe the other way that I'll answer it in more just like face-to-face human terms is that 
CNC and the way that we practice our progressivism is that we are working to finish unfinished neighborhoods so that that we're not shaming anybody for where it is that they are living. And we're able to ask the question and we found much success in being able to say, if you had all of the money and resources and decision-making power to finish this unfinished neighborhood, what would you like to see more of? And we've had success and we will continue, I expect, to be able to have success for that. There are, of course, people who will say, you don't belong here, they other us. And to that, I just say, my land is where my dead lie buried. My family has been here for generations. And because of that reality, because of many of the things that have happened and how this, this oppression economy has taken the lives of too many of my friends and family at an age where that was too young, whether because of health outcomes or because they were sent to fight wars over, in this case, oil too often, right? That I have a very big responsibility in the governing of my family and the finishing of our neighborhood. All of those things wrapped up into one. I think I would just repeat that a new California will come when we all together can say that it's our voice and our choice and our California. And that will be the definition or the, how we it is that we will continue to work to have a progressive future for California through CNC. I love that, Pablo. And I don't know if I can say that any better. I want to thank both of you for joining us today and having this important conversation. These are exactly the things I think about a lot working in politics, because it's not easy doing political work or movement work, and especially as people of color pushing up against longstanding systems that have so much power, so much influence, and so much money. But what really gives me hope and what gives me courage is working alongside people like you, Supervisor Mitchell and Pablo. It's hard. And it's also exciting work, because if we keep doing this for decades and decades, I just cannot imagine the kind of progress that my kids, our kids, our grandkids are going to see. I'm also confident that if we didn't do this work, things would continue as the status quo, and that's not working for most of us. So thank you again for speaking with us today. And thank you, Irene, for leading such an informative and important conversation. But the conversation doesn't have to end here. I'd love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. What do you think about the word progressive? Is the word progressive viewed as a four-letter word in your community? And what do you think about labels? Are they doing more harm or good in California? Let us know your thoughts by tagging us at CourageCA and using the hashtag CourageLooksGoodOnYou. And now... A shot of courage. Do you have an election coming up in your district? Visit CourageVoterGuide.org to find out when your next election is. Learn who the candidates are and which candidates Courage California has endorsed. Candidates who we identified as progressive champions who will work closely with our communities and strive for equity, justice, and accountability. It may only be spring, California, but we already have a couple of special elections happening in April. Courage has endorsed Tina McKenna for AD62, which includes parts of Los Angeles County. The election happens on April 5th, but voters are encouraged to turn in their ballots early. Courage has also endorsed David Campos for AD17, which includes parts of San Francisco County. This election will happen on April 19th. It is important that McKenna and Campos are elected and seated as soon as possible so they can vote and support on some very important legislation, including AB 1819, authored by Lee, also known as the Stop Foreign Influence in California Elections Act, which would bar foreign-influenced U.S.-based corporations from contributing to candidates, parties, or committees and protecting the integrity of California's government. And AB 2419, authored by Brian. This is known as the California Justice 40 Act, and would invest at least 40% of federal climate and infrastructure funding to communities that have been historically neglected by discriminatory policies, such as low-income, indigenous, and rural communities and communities of color. This is why it is so important that Californians vote for leaders who will vote in the interest of our communities. 
Voting for legislators is only part of the equation. We must also hold them accountable once they're in office. Courage California is proud to announce that our 7th annual Courage Score was released on February 28th. Visit CourageScore.org to find out who your state assembly member and senator are. See their scores in voting history and discover who to hold accountable and who to celebrate as champions. The annual Courage Score is a multi-issue report card that gives scores for all of California's state legislators. Those who best reflect the interests of their constituents are all-stars. And those who routinely support corporate interests will find themselves in our hall of shame. Courage Score is very easy to use and even shows which industries legislators get their corporate contributions from. I personally appreciate the transparent and comprehensive breakdown about each one of California's leaders in a simple and easy to use location. Visit CourageScore.org to find out who your legislators are and if they made the grade. I'm your host, Angela Chavez. And I'm Irene Gao, Executive Director of Courage California. And this has been Courage. It looks good on you. We hope you join us again next time because guess what, California? We're just getting started. And if you like this podcast, please rate it and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. <laughs>